This is not an easy uh, talk uh, for me to give because it's, um, see, I, I come from a very uh, dysfunctional family and uh, I need to talk about it. And <laughs> my therapist said that if I talk about it, it'll be a little easy. So, you know, my, I don't know all of you, I know enough, and you're a very compassionate group, so I'm sure you wouldn't mind my sort of talking out the dysfunction and seeing if I could work it out, even if it was a family matter. But unfortunately for this country, the dysfunction of my family is exactly the same dysfunction as our healthcare system. Now at that point you might say, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> so let me explain. I have a very precocious youngest daughter. And at the age of 15, at a, a family Thanksgiving dinner, we had invited a number of friends along, high-powered, ma major forces in the healthcare community. And my wife had sat them next to me, and then the whole rest of the family just, you know, moved out, kids in the next room and all that kind of, you understand that except for my youngest daughter who was sitting at the table, and the three of us were engaged in pretty high-level discussions about how we were going to transform the healthcare system. And my, at that point, I think 15-year-old daughter stops the conversation. She said, I've had enough. She said, Dad, you and your friends are totally useless. You big thinking economists with your fancy models and your big national systems have no impact on the practice of healthcare in America. This is a 15 year old. And I don't want to have anything to do with economists and anything. I want to help people. Shut us up. And it led to years of barely talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> she went on, and then I made a second mistake. She went on to go to Brandeis, <laughs> where she actually got a wonderful education, which made our problem worse. <laughs> and then decided that the Northeast was uh, not an acceptable place to grow, live in, and so she moved and decided that she was going to get a master's in public health, and she was going to focus on individuals and the community in terms of health care, and went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill to get a master's in public health, and refused to move back. Pay us a visit occasionally. <laughs> now has two grandchildren. I do from her. Um, so, not being able to get her to move to New England, I moved to Chapel Hill. <laughs> and so the battle that started when she was 15 years old continues. And as I said, I believe that it is at the center of the reason why we cannot get our healthcare system to really work well. We need to find a way for those of us who are the so-called big thinkers with our big national models and our big econometric models to recognize that healthcare at the end of the day is at the community level. And we need to figure out a way to make what we are doing at the national level work at the level that you work at. And in return, since you, those of you who are working, like my daughter, at the community level, need to think about the kinds of models and efforts that we should be thinking about at the national level to sort of make your life doable. And as I go through my talk, uh, I'm going to sort of touch on a couple of themes that were articulated in the speech. And 
So <clears throat> to show you how this dysfunction works, um, Harold, uh, you've met him. Um, <laughs> He's a little bit of an over-organizer, if you figured that out. <laughs> so in, a, in, addition, in addition to asking me to talk, he thought he would also give me the title of the talk. <laughs> so this is what happened. By mistake, I sent the, your title to my daughter. And she wrote back, hooray, you have, you have finally realized truth. And I said, and I said I'm not going to accept that lousy title. What are you, crazy? So I redid the title. But I tried to incorporate the best I could. Because, you know, I mean, I'm edging my way in the right direction. So, but to me, it, you know, we have a true national problem. And, and it's going to dominate, dominate everything we do in healthcare f for the next umpteen years. And a lot of it is going to be determined by government because of the changing population and the fact that our institutions are increasingly, whether we, whatever we do, be treating uh, national uh, uh, governmentally financed patients. But we need to do it in a way that integrates care at the community level. There is no way that those of us who think about things, and I think less about Washington these days, and I'll talk about Massachusetts in a minute, which is getting much closer to the community. We need to work at a level that brings us all together. Now, you all know this, and I'm just gonna go through it, but it, this is part of my religion, so bear with me. You know, this. The, the, the financial problems at the national level, particularly in Medicare, are going to dominate our lives. You know, I mean, you've hear it, the conservatives, but even the, you know, you can't ignore the fact that when you play out the idea that the Medicare and the other entitlements are going to be chewing up. Now, I happen to be a, hey, let, let me be very clear. I am a big believer in these entitlements. I wouldn't be here without these entitlements. To me, I am going to go down. Medicare is going to survive. I keep telling people I'm going to make sure it survives because I want to live forever and I want them to fund me forever. So this is part of the deal. But, and you know, so if you look at this percentage of our GDP, you know, there's, you know, George Bush thought he had a problem with Social Security. Social Security is not a problem. Social Security by itself, you know, it goes from four to six percent of GDP, not a big deal. Oh, there's Medicare. Oh, by the way, there's Medicaid. You know, when you start adding them all up, it's a big deal. And no matter, you know, you know, however you want to deal with this problem, it's a big deal. And what's more, when you start talking about the federal deficit, Medicare is the dominant. Now, how do you deal with the fact that is another question. And I, I'm not going to go into detail. I'll be glad to give that talk at some other time. I will tell you this program needs more revenue, but that's, we'll talk more about that later. The problem is it's real. So <clears throat> here's the issue that I want to get to quickly. The federal government cannot do it alone. We need to engage at a lower level, and we need to start with the states. And the states have to change their thought process and move away from the idea that their total responsibility is with the Medicaid program. States need to recognize that they have responsibility that go to all of their citizens, that affect not only how they spend their Medicaid dollars, but what happens to private insurance, what happens to individuals with no insurance, how their system is organized, and ultimately the state needs to deal with the local and community levels. We cannot solve this problem from the federal government, and you cannot solve the problem from the community level. It is not possible. You can do good things, and everything you do I admire. You will never solve the problem unless we can bring together the forces from, on, from the federal and bring it from the community. It's just too big, and it's not because you don't want to do the right things. So how are we going to deal with it? And one of the areas that I'm saying is that indirectly, all the good things you do to help on the margin, say for private insurance, is like a drop in the bucket 
when you have the federal government totally wanting to control its own dollars and squeezing Medicare money and our big, powerful private institutions try squeezing out every extra dollar they can from private insurance. So you save a nickel, and then they cost shift by dollars, big dollars. And for those of you from the business community, you have become the biggest tax collector in the country. You are the ultimate tax collector to the tune of probably 20% of our total health care dollars at the hospital level. What happens is that Medicare and Medicaid squeeze down. Our big private institutions look at their budget and say, my God, we can't survive on Medicare and Medicaid money alone. And here comes the poor guy from the private, I don't care how big they are, whether it's United or Blue Cross or left like that, and what happens is that they tack on 15, 20, 25 percent onto the premiums to keep their institutions going. States need to be involved in that. They cannot ignore it. So, a little bit of history since I've been doing this for a very long time. We have tried at the, at the United States level to control health care costs in my lifetime four major times, and every time we failed. So let's do a little quick history. First, we had the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, thank you, the 60s, where, you know, economists said, hey, you're adding all these insurance, health care is probably going to double or triple. Well, it went up 10 times, but, you know, we were off by a few zeros. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, like everything else, you know, we all date history from when you start, right? So I don't know anything about health care. I'm an expert on women. Which is, and I did my dissertation on unemployed married women. I'm an expert. I don't know anything about health care. And that made me uniquely qualified to get involved in health care. <laughs> now, how does a good, so, and there I, as Harold pointed out, I wound up in the Nixon administration. How's a good kid from the Bronx wind up in the Nixon administration? I do not talk about sober. We'll just let that part go. <laughs> So there I started in 1971, working for these strange people called Republicans. I, I, I was fine with me. I mean, I, listen, I came, you know, in economics, we learn religion. And I went to, trust me, a very religious, I went to a University of Chicago farm school, for those of you who know economics. I knew all about the, I mean, I knew all the words. I, I fit in perfectly, you know, just, and I didn't know it. And it turned out to be a phenomenal period. So I started in 1971, and the f I'm in my job uh, about a month. August of 1971, President Nixon imposes wage and price controls on this country. He does it on a sat Sunday, think he's going to sleep it in while people are sleeping or in <laughs> church. Or I think the only person that didn't know he did it was me. I had a seven-year-old daughter, scored her first goal in soccer. I was a happy father. I come into work on Monday morning in August of 1971, a very hot summer day in Washington, D.C., and my secretary is as white as a ghost. And I go, what's the matter? She said, the White House wants to see you. Now, this was the era of Haldeman and Ehrlichman. People went to the White House and were never seen again. <laughs> So we both go into my desk after about 50 minutes. She said, you've got to go to the White House. I said, I, I have three kids. I'll not go to the White House. <laughs> anyway, I got enough nerve. I went to the White House. President, sitting around the table is all the president's men. Sorry, there were no women there. Sitting around, and the cha chairman of the Council of Economic Advice said, Dr. Altman, you know how much money we're spending on health care? And even before I had a chance to say anything, I had just found out because a young fellow by the name of Bob Lendon worked for me. And, and, and he told me, because I didn't know. I'm, anyway, he says, we are spending 7.5% of our GDP on health care. Amounts to $78 billion. If we reach 8%, our whole way of life is going to deteriorate. And you're going to solve change. <laughs> President of the United States wants me to control health care costs. <laughs> I'm 32 years old. What the hell do I know? <laughs> and I became the first regulator, the only regulator this country has ever had to control all health care costs out of Washington. 
and I was supremely successful for about an hour. <laughs> you know, if I tell all the stories, I won't get to any of the slides, and you'll never finish. But <laughs> there's one more story. So this is the Republicans, you see, it's not the Democrats, so they're going to do it on the cheap. So they don't want to, they don't want to add any workers. So they say, okay, now we're going to, you're going to set up the regulations, and I, oh yeah, I can do that. So I get a few of my friends, we're going to do all that kind of stuff. We have the Cost of Living Council, and they said, okay, we need a group to ultimately find out whether the doctors in the hospitals are following the rules. So guess which group they picked, which group is most feared by doctors and hospitals in, in the of, of federal government. The Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> so the President of the United States sends an executive order to the, to the head of the Internal Revenue Service to say, you are responsible for evaluating whether our hospitals and our doctors are meeting the requirements. And the requirements is that physician fees could not go up by more than 2.5, and hospitals could not go up by more than 4. And we start doing our work. So about a year goes by, and we think everything's working fine, because you're in Washington, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it takes three years for Washington to figure out what's going on. Trust me, I, I know that. And three is not as early. So anyway, I get a year, about a year later, I get a request to meet with the number two person at the Internal Revenue Service, and, and they, they said, we're coming to you. And this guy comes, he must have just got out of the Marines. He, his neck was as wide as I was tall. He, 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 and two more, and he sat there with, I mean, and he looked at me and he said, um, Dr. Altman, he said, um, we have been looking into how hospitals operate. And he said, now I, I don't know, how, I can't, there was I think two legitimate words that I could use in his next sentence. <laughs> He said, I don't care what kind of flying you want us to, we are not going to regulate them. It is the most, it is an industry that defies understanding. <laughs> they have an accounting, they have cost, they have price, nothing works together, stuff like that. It is impossible. We would have to use every IRS agent we have, and we still wouldn't be able to do it. We are not going to do it. I said, my five foot five frame gets up and President of the United States has asked you to do it, you're gonna do it. He said, I don't give a flying. Who asked me to do it? We are not doing it. <laughs> this goes on for 20 minutes. I know I'm losing. So finally I said, would you do me one favor? Would you not tell anybody? <laughs> and for three years, Doctors and hospitals thought they were being evaluated. Nobody <laughs> was looking at their books. But it worked. <laughs> so here is the economic stabilization program. All right, so now I'm going to get to the part that affects you. We're on a roll in Washington. These are Republicans. We decide in 1974 we passed a law that created around the country we created around the country the biggest health planning operation the world has ever seen. And we modeled it to a large extent oh, after what was going on in Rochester, New York, which you just heard about. What was true? Rochester was so much beyond where every, it was a community level effort. And it had created in the state of New York, certificate of need, and we decided to take that and create a model. This meeting we're having today, if you had this meeting in 1975, you would have had a th several thousand, several thousand people. We create, anybody here that remembers and was involved in health planning? Tell me if I'm, am I right? Around the country, we created these A agencies and B agencies, so we had an A agency at the state level, and then we had these C agencies around, and we got all the community, pay. people were really working. I have to tell one more story. So I became responsible for setting up these agencies all over the country, because they were all funded by the federal government. Now there's a problem. 
when you get a kid from the Bronx whose geographic understanding of this country was limited, who had flown across the country a few times but had no idea where the rest of the, how the country. I'll just give you one or two stories. We had an econometric model that decided how many aid, uh, community agencies would exist in each area, depending upon the population and the way the thing goes. Anybody here from the state of Washington? So we decided, based on this model, that the state of Washington should get one planning agency. Because you didn't, there were about five people there. And <laughs> we get a call from the, and we issue with the, you know, the draft regs. We get a call from the governor's office. They go, how can you give us one planning agency? I said, well, that's based on the population. I said, do you realize that there's a mountain range in the, <laughs> really? <laughs> Not a clue. The people in the east have never seen the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> They are not allowed to go to Seattle. <laughs> you want to create one planning agency that's going to be in Seattle, and the whole rest of the state on the other side of those mountains, you have to go do at least two. So I said, well, we'll think about it. The second thing we did, we decided there was no state of New Jersey. <laughs> True. We decided regionally, nobody in New Jersey gets their health care in New Jersey. <laughs> Northern part goes to New York, southern part goes to Philadelphia. So we wiped out the state of New Jersey. <laughs> this is what you do at the national level. <laughs> Princeton, uh, you know. <laughs> the governor of the state of New Jersey was not a happy camper. <laughs> anyway, we created this thing. And you know what? It really worked. It really began. Communities took on this, the business community, the, the payer community, the hospitals, working together to create a model. And, but I was just we, talking to Judy. And, but yet, at the, after, after four or five years, and it really was working and doing all these kind of things, controlling costs, limiting the growth. And we actually leveled this thing off. But ultimately, it became a gigantic bureaucratic. It got, it got bought over by the providers. Lawyers sued. It was a field day for accountants and consultants. And we let it fail. It wasn't the wrong model. It was something we need to do. And when we talk about the things you're talking about, we need to begin to recreate. And you're the model for that. But we also didn't develop at the national level a payment system that worked. So these people didn't have the power that they needed to make this thing mesh together. It failed, but not because it was not a good idea. And you know, just like neckties or skirt lengths or whatever, you know, the past is not always a bad thing. So we need to move because look what happened when we did away with it. That's the 80s. I call it halfway competitive markets, ineffective regulation. Katie barred the door. The healthcare community could do whatever it wanted. And you know, I, we started out with the insurance industry. Oh, this is wonderful. This is great. We're, we can now do What a lot of crap. By the end of the 80s, everybody was in panic mode. The employer community said, you know, we had Lee Iacocca coming out saying they're moving all the car manufacturing from Chrysler to, to, to um, to Canada, and then Bill Clinton comes along. And my boss, Judy Fader, uh, thanked, brought me down to Washington to help her and help uh, the Clinton team create this thing. And we remember Little Rock, so we have Little Rock. In Little Rock, Red, uh, uh, the head of Red Poling, the head of Ford Motor Company, was right before me. And then I testified on what was going on. And, and what was going on was the 80s. And so then we. Well, Clinton didn't quite make it and in terms of health care and had a few little other problems. But, <laughs> but we introduced managed care. And again, managed care was really promoted by everybody. It was the liberal group. You know, we, you know, we were going to do community things. The conservatives was market. Everyone looked at managed care from their own. It was like the elephant. People were looking at it from different sides, and everybody saw what they wanted. And everybody thought it was the right thing. But as it played out, 
It did everything we asked it to do, and we hated it. Why did we hate it? And I'm going to talk more about it, is that we forgot one group. We forgot the patients. And we didn't include them in the model, and they rebelled. And ultimately, managed care was killed by the four Ps. First, it was the provider community. They didn't like being second-guessed and third-guessed and so on and forth. And then they convinced us as patients that we were being denied needed care. And then they convinced the press, and we had movies and television, and, and then we convinced the politicians. And by the end of the 90s, Katie barred the door, you know, and we had people saying, oh, we can do away with managed care and HMOs. We'll have no impact on health care costs. What a lot of malarkey. We have seen, since the end of the 90s, the biggest growth in health care in the history of this country. So we've gone through these periods of time, and the question is, what's going to happen going forward? As I said, I started at 7.5% of GDP. I don't need to tell you. We're at 17 point something percent. We'll probably be at 18 by the end of the meeting. Um, <laughs> So we need to figure this out, and, we, and, and that's what this is all about. How can, can we succeed this time? And what I'd just like to just leave you with is a few what I call errors of the past and how we can get about it. So let me get through that. The key is to get our healthcare system to be more efficient. To, we want good quality care. We want good access but we need to have it at a rate that this country can afford. Now, at 7.5%, I knew, because the head of the Council of Economic Advisors told me that if we reached 8%, our whole way of life would deteriorate. I don't know what the right number is anymore. I don't think this country is going to fall apart if we hit 20% of GDP. I may fall apart, but I don't know what the right number is, but I do know we're, we're again inching very close, and I don't care what part of the community you look at, whether it's the federal government or the state government or employers or individuals, our ability to continue to support this thing is just chewing up resources. We've seen at the community level that we're firing teachers and firemen and policemen and librarians um, at, the, at the expense of the healthcare system. That is not right. I spend a lot of time with the healthcare system I'm on our boards of hospitals and so on and so forth. They're very proud of what they do, and I'm very proud of what they do. It's nice that they're the engines of growth, but remember, there's another side that isn't the engines, and we need to find that balance. It's balance. It's not one or the other. And again, you cannot do this at the community level without a redesigned payment system. It's just too hard. It's not that you're not doing the right thing. You're, run, you know, you're like that poor salmon trying to swim upstream, and the water is just pushing you back harder and harder. You need help. And the only place you can get help is from government. You need the government to change its payment system. You need private insurance to change their payment system. I have my good friend there. You know, and the, the, provi the private insurance has been slowly changing because it got really beat up in the 90s. And it finally figured out in 2000, in that period of time when it got beat up, it was much easier to raise premiums than to really mess around with the provider community. And the truth of the matter is, managed care became a big bunch of wimps. And in the process, they made a lot of money. So we need government to change, we need the private system to change, but we need to change it in a way that's consistent with the community. So, but we need to end fee-for-service. And I believe these current changes in the delivery system are a movement in the right direction, but they cannot do it alone. These ACO models, these are, you know, now we call them, we used to call them managed care, or bundled payments, they do have the capacity to financially encourage the integration of care, so which allows us to substitute less expensive for more expensive care to reduce the use of marginal ineffective care. We tried it at the national, you can't do it through certificate of need. You gotta get the, commu the provider community to say, it isn't in our financial interest and it's not in the patient's interest to do that test or to do that procedure or to put them in the hospital. They could do it better at home. They could do it better in a different way. And, <clears throat> 
We need to get facilities and people. It's easy to talk about this, very hard to work on, to get, and we, hospitals, physicians, post-acute, I'm gonna talk a little about post-acute. You have a lot, of, you're meeting on the, the acute care side. The big battle is gonna be on the post-acute side. I'm gonna show you the numbers. And that's where, again, my daughter is ahead of the curve. By the way, the next time you invite an Altman to come to give a talk, get my daughter, she's on the right <laughs> side of this question. Um, so, so the key is better integration and coordination of appropriate care. Each one of those words means something. And you can start with appropriate. If you coordinate and integrate bad care, big deal. I mean, that's what we, you know, people can show all the coordination, integration you're doing. I say, but yeah, but did you need it, the care? So you start with appropriate care, but if you have appropriate care that isn't, you know, doesn't work together, isn't coordinated, isn't integrated, then it just leads to higher costs. And it needs, we all know the story. And the things that you're doing in expanding primary care, more power to your home and community-based care. Now, <clears throat> ACOs are the, the ultimate right model. Harold and I have had some differences, but he's right, and I'm wrong, except I'm right. <laughs> Figure that one out. He's right. We need to do this at the basic physician level. The key to the ACOs is a well-integrated primary physician care model moving forward, using only care at the level that needs to be get. I said, you try to do this without getting the hospitals involved, you're gonna fight the same battle I fought in the 70s. You can't win this system without co-opting, co do it the right word, the most powerful forces in our community, namely the hospitals. That's where the money is, that's where the integration. We gotta get them to do, so that's what I'm saying. You're right, I'm, what I'm saying is we gotta get them involved and then do the right thing. So this idea of ACOs makes sense, but uh, it's a hard thing to do in many communities, and so bundled payments, where you begin to take a smaller segment of, a, of an episode over a particular, is, is the beginning of getting physicians and, and hospitals and ACOs to work together. And again, we can do that if the federal government changes the system. But the federal government cannot in any way impact on the delivery system. That's where your job is, to get the community and the delivery system to work. So let's look at these so-called errors of the past. What are they? First of all, the 90s. We went to physician groups and hospitals, and we said to them, be responsible for, the words are going to sound familiar, total population. Population? What population? We know patients that come in, we know them. We don't know who lives next door, we don't know who lives around the corner, we have no idea. So we said, don't worry about it, it's fine. Well, it wasn't fine. They took on risks, they had no idea what they were taking on. They were asked to do things, and what happened? For the first few years, it worked fine. Anything could work fine for a few years. It's at the end of the day, we began to squeeze on them, more and more, and they failed. They began to go under, because they, this population that they didn't know what they had came at them, with serve, asked for services they didn't know. That would turn out to be a problem. Second, when I started my job in 1971, some guy knocked at my door, and he said, um, he said my name is Scott Fleming. He said, uh, you have my job. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I was hired to be the deputy, government people who love this, the deputy assistant secretary for health slash planning and evaluation. And you're the deputy assistant secretary for planning and evaluation slash health. <laughs> now, it turns out he came from Kaiser Permanente. Now, I'm from New York. I never heard of Kaiser Permanente. <laughs> Sounded to me like a communist plot. <laughs> so I said, explain this to me. And then we get these people coming in from, uh, from the West to telling the Nixon administration that what we need to do is create all these things called integrated health plans and stuff like that. And they start talking about it. And I keep hearing about this stuff, and I, you know, people work together, and they get care in the community, and, and it sounds, I said, it sounds like, you know, a 
commune. I said, what else goes on in these? You know, <laughs> remember, this was the early 70s. We had just come out of the 60s. I was beginning to get more interested in this thing. <laughs> I said, this is ridiculous. This is America. We believe in markets and free enterprise and FIFA service. That's what I believed in. That's what I was taught in economics. That's what it's all about. But I began to become convinced, but I wasn't convinced. So we sent them away. Well, they, did, they went away and then they went to the White House <laughs> and they told the president and Holderman and those characters. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a call up to the secretary saying, you sent those people away? The president wants you to listen to them. Yes, sir. So I listened. So I said, but what do you call these things? They call prepaid group practice. I said, it sounds like a disease. <laughs> so they came back and they said, we're going to call them health maintenance organizations. I said, why didn't you say that in the first place? What a wonderful idea. You're going to maintain people's health rather than make them sick. That's great. So we became a big force. Now, what I learned from the Kaiser people, among many others that became my friends, is you never force people into these organizations. You let people choose. If they want to stay in the FIFA service system, let them. They may not get the same care and stuff like that. We wanted people in Kaiser who wanted to be there. What happened in the 90s? I'll tell you what happened in the 90s. The insurance industry went to the employers, and they said, if you send us all of your employees, not just a few, we will guarantee you no premium increases but you have to send us all your workers. And so the employers faced with these double digit increases year in and year out said we're in. And we forced millions of Americans into HMOs that didn't want to be there. Well, you learn something. You force people into an organization they don't want to be in, it doesn't take them long to realize that they don't like where they are. And that was part of the problem, force millions. Third. We promised the American people that this was not only for costs, that it was going to improve quality. What a load of malarkey. We had no way to measure quality. Oh, we had a few measures here and there. But the truth of the matter is, it became a totally cost game, not a smart move. Third, under bundle payments, we created the DRG system. The DRG system was supposed to be for hospitals and doctors, but the doctors stopped it and it became only hospitals. Second, we thought today the federal government, tomorrow private insurance. Private insurance took one look at the DRG system and said, we don't want any part of it. We're going to stick with per diem, and what we're going to do is send nurses in there, and we're going to manage the care at the hospital. This per diem thing, too complicated, we don't need it. And so you had Medicare just doing a little bit of the puzzle all by itself. It helped a little bit, not a big deal. So where are we today? Do we have a chance? So let me just go through quickly. First of all, the bundle that we're talking about, the new bundle that is being experimented with, no longer is just hospital. It's hospitals, physicians, and it includes um, uh, post-hospital care. So, um, and let me get to the one I want. Second, the ACOs are what we call shared savings. They say to the provider community, look, don't take on more risk than you know what you're doing. Learn how to swim, put your toesies in the water, go up to your knees, you know, get used to the water. You know, at some point we you know, don't say it, but I think we're gonna go to full risk. But in the beginning, it's just the beginning. It's, Learn how to play together. Second, this is a troubling aspect, but the consumer movement forced the government in the uh, Affordable Care Act to allow Medicare recipients to bop in and out of a plan. So if you, it, it, while the ACO exists, the, the, if a patient is in an ACO, first of all, they don't even know they're in an ACO, now they're supposed to know, but if halfway through the thing they have a serious illness and they want to bop out, the ACO cannot keep them in. It's very troubling for the provider community. I don't think it's a long-term model that's sustainable, but it's the right model. People have to get used to the idea that they're part of a system, but if they feel trapped in some way, let them out. And so the Affordable Care Act does that. Three. 
key to getting the extra money in the ACO models or the bundled payments or the new experiments is not only that you're controlling costs, but that you're meeting quality measures. Now, these quality measures are still not perfect. We were talking about them at the break. They're too process-oriented. We need to move towards more outcome, but they're much better than they were in the 2000 period. They're not perfect, but at least quality is on the board equal to costs, a big plus. Again, we're going to have better coordination in the bundled payments between hospitals and physicians. And, you know, as I said, the equipment of uh, cost. And <clears throat> we need, to, if we're going to save money, we cannot just pass all that money back to government or back to the employer. We need to share those savings with the individual. If an individual is going to move into a tightly managed system where they're going to give up choice, which I think they will have to do, they ought to see the benefits to themselves as well as to others, or they're not going to like it very long. Now, I just want to spend, you, you've seen these numbers, but they are just staggering, and no one that I know of believed them until you see them. So when you're looking at some of the key um, uh, metrics in the federal thing and you look, so here is the uh, major joint replacement or heart failure or renal failure. This is the amount of money. This is a group of hospitals um, in 2008. And that's the amount of money that was spent on average in the hospital. Look at this. That's the total that was spent for those DRGs for all the care. And look at the big size of the, the um, reddish and the green. Those are what is being spent outside the hospital after the patient leaves for rehab, for nursing home care, for the extra care. The hospital community has taken one look at these numbers and they're going, oh my god. So if, you know, you talk about, they realize, and even within the blue, there is a lot more savings to be made. And that, but now the interesting issue, battle possible that you can help on, is to develop mechanisms to not only reduce the blue, that has to happen within the hospital, but by better coordination, better determination, get those that red and green down. That's the 30 days post-acute or 90 days post-acute. You can just see the, in, the hospital index was 42% of the total. Acute re, readmissions, 6%. Rehab, 6%. SNFs, 17 This is when you add it all up. This is where the money went. The money did not stay. We tend to focus a lot of our efforts, in the, Lee, me, on the acute care side, I think the world ended at the acute care. It does not. Now, maybe when you're dealing with um, uh, you know, people in working age, it doesn't look like this. But this is where the money is. This is Medicare and Medicaid. And so just to give you a feel, same thing for congestive heart failure. Only 28% of the dollars spent was in the hospital. So. How are we going to make this work? And again, let me go back to my theory, my, not my theory, my strong wish, is we got to get the states involved. So just a brief little thing about what we're doing in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, because it passed uh, its first, the, the, health, the comprehensive health insurance plan in 2006, the state of Massachusetts took responsibility in their legislature say we are not only responsible for Medicaid, we are responsible because they got really pushed by small businesses and individuals. You're forcing us to buy insurance and you're leaving those insurance premiums to go up 20, 30, 40 percent. You want to stay in your job? You have to worry about us. And they have. So in July of this past year, 2012, they passed the third piece of, of cost containment legislation. And it's key is that the state is now responsible for all health care in Massachusetts. And the key to what they want to do is to restructure the system and to try to do it without imposing government regulation, whether they can pull it off or not. So what's the main provisions of the law? First of all, the state has gone on record in saying over the next 10 years, it does not want to see its total health care spending grow by more than the long-term growth in the state's GDP. And that after the first five, it should even grow by a little less. 
than state GDP. And to make that work, it's, it's going to use every mechanism it has short of forcing to encourage the development of new delivery systems and to provide financial support to poorer hospitals to help them transform their system into better systems. And it does require all insurers to provide what we call tiered networks to allow these formations of more focused uh, delivery systems with appropriate reductions in premiums and so on. Now, to make this all so-called work, they created what they called an independent health policy commission, independent in the sense that it is not technically controlled by either the governor or the state legislature, and it has 11 commissioners, two of which are state employees, and for whatever reason, the governor appointed me as its chair. People congratulated me and said, why are you doing this? But that's another story. So, uh, so what is it we supposed to do? Well, we have to make sure that every provider and payer really begins to change the way they do business. And we're to look in, we have access to all kind of new data. We, we're going to understand, we're supposed to, how providers are organized, how they pay internally, what the, how they're organized. And if they're not organized the right way and they're leading to higher inflation, we can go in and, and suggest that they change. And if they don't change, we can find them or we can turn them over to the attorney general if we believe it's being done in terms of restraint of trade. As again, uh, they must meet these goals. In addition, the Department of Insurance in Massachusetts, like New York and California, has gotten very, very tough on insurance rates. They've said to the insurance companies, we're no longer going to give you premium increases because you claim that it's because health care costs have gone up. You shouldn't be letting those health care costs go up. So they took the Blue Cross rates. Blue Cross said, we need 12% because health care went up 11 and we want 1% for because we're nice people. And they said, we'll give you five. And they said, well, we can't. The, the health care, they said, well, go back and renegotiate. And you know what? They are. We're renegotiating with our providers. And our providers, our hospitals, we don't have the weakest hospitals in America. <laughs> but you know what? They're really, I, at least they're talking a good game. I think they really are legitimately want to make a difference, even our big time fellas. And, um, and I, you know, I, I know them, I like them, they're my friends, they're my health care. Although I'm thinking of going to Maine. I think it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Will you take me? <laughs> I think it's going to be safer. Um, there's a special fund that's set up again to invest in public health, prevention, and new workforce. We know we need more primary care providers. We know we need more in public health. This is where the community can come in. There's actual money in there to do that. Um, and ultimately, if this doesn't work, after three or four years, we can go back to the legislature and say, hey, you got to give us more power. And uh, it's at that point I'm retiring. Uh, <laughs> I've been a regulator. I, I was 32. I'm not 32 anymore. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this independent require, we have to decide if there's going to be any merger or acquisition, whether it's what impact it has on inflation, what impact it has on consumers' access, quality. There's a reg registry set up to determine what delivery systems look like. And what's critical, I think, it's to better educate consumers about what's going on from the beginning, because they have no way, they don't know HM, and, and I've learned the hard way. So that's what we're gonna do. We have other provisions to, to worry about uh, malpractice, um, adequacy of public payments on Medicaid, and reduce the cost of prescription. We're beginning that process, watch us. I'm not saying it's gonna succeed, but I think it's the beginning of a major trend. We're beginning to see that in Vermont and in a few others. States need to play a bigger role because ultimately it needs to filter down to the community. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.